So this morning I introduced W algebras and uh, this is simply the definition. It's the definition as a certain cohomology with this character and uh, we, we saw the structural properties. Now, um, no one can uh, do many things. One can ask what's the re representation theory of those, when are there, uh, uh, when there are there quotients interesting, and, uh, um, and, and, and and one can go on, one can ask whether what's the meaning in physics, and, it's, and it turns out there are meaning in physics is plenty. Um, I decided uh, I, I will talk about coincidences, so you'll see, or coincidences, uh, what I mean by is that uh, I, I get isomorphisms of vertex algebras that uh, seem to, I mean, they are not obvious at all. Um, and, and then I will uh, tell you, I will, uh, I will only tell you in words uh, why uh, or one in instance where these W algebras appear and uh, the picture we will have in mind is we want to look at a big Y and annotate that a little bit. <coughs> Um, okay, so the the, the, the slogan is uh, always these uh, these interesting vertex algebras can be realized in seemingly v very different ways, with the benefit that each way hopefully has one way that uh, has a certain some properties that help you better understand it. And uh, so the cohomological way that I introduced is in the first place the definition. It's very clean. It tells you where it comes from. It gives you certain structural properties for free, right? What property does it give you for free? It is uh, realized as, a, as the cohomology of an affine vertex algebra times something. And of course, I can replace my affine vertex algebra by any module uh, uh, of it. Then I take the same something, the same free field algebra, and I automatically get a complex of, uh, of uh, 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 a complex whose uh, cohomology will be a module for the W algebra. So this cohomological uh, construction has the good advantage that it immediately gives a functor from the representation category of the affine vertex algebra to the W algebra. Okay. Uh, anyway, that, uh, let, let me go on with uh, cosets. Uh, first, uh, let's define what a coset is. So what we have is we have uh, a big view A V and a subalgebra W, a sub view A uh, W. And now uh, we define the commutant or coset of W in V to be the set, as first of all, the set of uh, un, and the underlying vector space is the subspace of V of those vectors that are vacuum vectors for the subalgebra. What means? What does it mean to be a, a, a vacuum vector? It means that any uh, non-negative mode acts as uh, as as zero, and uh, this has to hold for all. Uh, W and W. Okay. Now, uh, one can, uh, 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 in particular, if you use uh, our OPE together with duality, one can show, so that's, uh, I, I will not write exercise, but uh, anyway, this would be an exercise that this implies that the corresponding fields, the field corresponding to W and the field corresponding to V, that their uh, commutator is zero. And in particular, uh, the, the fields of the big VOA restricted to the subspace induce a VOA structure on the subspace. And it has the name, the coset of W in V. So this name coset comes from physics, everything comes from physics. And uh, it is uh, what they were looking, physicists were looking at 
uh, something called gauged Westomina Witten models and uh, uh, which, uh, whose symmetry algebra is described by such commutants. And uh, uh, geometrically, they think about these as conformal field theories whose target space is not a, the compact Lie group. That would be the case in the westomina witten case, but a corresponding homogeneous space, a corresponding core set. Um, so that's where it's coming from. Now, one thing one can uh, uh, compute. So uh, if we take um, if we take an affine vertex algebra, our W, so this is our W inside a bigger VOA. Why does it imply this? I mean, what, what is it that we would have to change? Um, so, so this statement immediately uh, implies that uh, the OPE of two fields, um, I mean, uh, we have this also. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, so um, th th this here is immediate. Because um, what do we have here? Uh, I mean, if you have now uh, two fields in the core set, then uh, we know there are OPEs determined by the commutator, but by Jacobi identity of commutators, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the commutator of two uh, fields in the core set has, uh, has also this property. And, um, uh, and this one here is actually, these two statements are in fact equivalent. Um, so if we have an affine sub-algebra, which is the most common case, such that the fields of the affine sub-algebra uh, have this nice OPE with the Virasoro field, one says they are quasi-primary with respect to the Virasoro action. Which, which happens most often for any x in our Lie algebra, then it is not hard to compute that the Virasoro uh, element of the Virasoro field of V minus the Shugavara vector that, uh, of, of the subalgebra that's given by the Casimir is uh, in the commutant and is itself a Virasoro field. And it's, it's a Virasoro field of central charge. What could it possibly be? The central charge of the big Virasoro field minus the central charge of the affine subalgebra. Okay. And now um, let me. Uh, and, and now the core sets came uh, became important in the 80s when uh, Goddard, Goddard, Kent, and Olive introduced them, and they introduced them for the spe specific example where V is just the affine vertex algebra of SL2 at level K times the simple affine vertex algebra of SL2 at level 1. Then one has a diagonal action at level k plus 1. One always has a diagonal action where the levels add up in those cases. And they ask, what's the commutant? And they observe the commutant is nothing but the Virasoro algebra. Well, what did we learn this morning? We, this morning, we learned the Virasoro algebra is the W algebra of SL2. So we see in that case that uh, the W algebra of SL2 also appears as a coset, and uh, that was uh, often that's called the GKO coset construction or minimal model in specific levels. It uh, um, um, it, it, it it was always a central thing. And now let me state as a theorem how this generalizes, and we so. Um, the first case is G is simply laced. So G is of type A, D, or E. Then we have that the principal W algebra of G at level K is isomorphic to the core set of the affine vertex algebra of G at level L 
inside the tensor product of the fn vertex algebra of g at level l minus 1 times the simple affine vertex algebra at level one. Remember, if the level is a positive integer, I told you that the, the simple quotient is particularly small and things are part particularly nice. Um, here, what happens is that this k and l are related by this formula, the inverses of the shifted levels add up to the lacity, one. Okay, so this uh, this 1980s physicist uh, saw this pattern. They conjectured it. Uh, uh, Arakawa, Linshaw, and Ivy proved this a few years ago. Um, and in fact, uh, by now, <laughs> by now I have three different proofs of the statement. So I'm, I really like that. Um, Okay, what happens in the non-simply laced case? In the non-simply laced case, one, one, uh, one, one doesn't necessarily expect that uh, the W algebra is realized by as a coset of a W algebra of the same type. Well, there are two statements that are known. The first of all, in the type C case, it is a coset by a subalgebra of type C as well, but inside a superalgebra, in fact. So OSP 1 slash 2n, who, who knows how OSP 1, two, uh, 1 slash 2n, that's a least superalgebra, what do, does it look like as an SP2n module? Who, who knows that? Yeah? Yes, please? Are you, are you, in, you didn't want to answer. Yeah, uh, Just say it for OSP, OSP 1, 2. Yeah, I, oh, okay. A anyway, it, it, it turns out uh, OSP 1 uh, slash 2n is the only simple Lie super algebra whose even sub algebra is simple. It's just SP 2n itself, and its odd part is nothing but the standard representation. So in particular, um, the, the affine vertex algebra of OSP 1 slash 2n, it, it behaves in many, many respects like a, a Lie algebra. And for example, it has this uh, nice, uh, nice uh, property that it is nothing but an extension of the W algebra of type C times the affine vertex algebra of type uh, C. Note, uh, we don't talk about representation theory anymore, but whenever you have a, a, a coset statement, then you always have also an, a very nice relation between representation categories of the three involved vertex algebras, which is really nice, which you can, you can imagine. Right. Okay, so here what happens is uh, the inverses... Um, so here it turns out that the inverses of um, so here um, k is uh, generic and generic allows for everything except rational, uh, rational numbers that are too negative uh, L is generic I mean, if I, if I say it like with the rational numbers. Anyway, it, it holds for generic levels, and at, at very specific levels, uh, it, it can change a tiny bit. Um, okay, and uh, uh, so here, one thing you see is also, here all of a sudden, actually, super algebras get involved. Um, and... Yeah. I, mean, I want to know how it is embedded. Yeah, so uh, if we have a, um, two, uh, the tensor product of two affine vertex algebras at level k and k tilde, for example, so then uh, here we have the, uh, then we have uh, fields at level k corresponding to uh, the, for, for, for the, 
For the right factor, you just get the, take the identity and the same thing for the right action. And so you, you, you just take the diagonal embedding. Let, let me give it a, an, an index, maybe, maybe one that corresponds to the first factor and second factor. Anyway, uh, the, the sum of the generating fields, you can check it. the OPE is linear, right? So what, what's the OPE of uh, uh, x1 plus x2, uh, the, the, uh, the field corresponding to the Lie algebra x in the first copy and in the second copy? The OPE is uh, linear, so, so that means the second order pole um, comes with k plus k prime, k tilde as coefficient. The first order pole is, uh, uh, you, you get what you get from the commutator of this one and plus what you get from this one. So, so you, you immediately check that this uh, diagonal embedding gives you an affine vertex algebra structure of type G where the levels add up. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, there's uh, one more type of these statements. So all these theorems are, are quite recent and uh, uh, we, we de developed a lot of technology in order to do those. Um, and let me also remember the quantum Hamilton, the, the W algebra definition, I used a Lie super algebra and, uh, as input. So one can also ask whether certain Lie super algebras are nicely realized as corsets. And it turns out the OSP one appears in a, I, I'll continue here, appears in a, in a, in a corset of type B. So I, here this F2n plus 1 denotes the free field sub, uh, uh, fermion algebra of 2n plus 1 free fermions. And this statement looks like a surprise if you know nothing about OSP1 slash 2n, but if you're familiar with OSP1 slash 2n, you, you, you know that in fact OSP1 slash 2n appears, uh, behaves in many, many respects like uh, SO2n plus 1. For example, there are root systems, uh, uh, coincides, except that the short node or, or root of OSP is an odd root and its square is also a root. It turns out uh, the finite dimensional representations of OSB 1 slash 2n are symmetric tensor equivalent, in particular abelian equivalent, uh, to the non-spin representations of type B. So they, there's an ex extremely close connection. And in the VOA setting, it is, for example, reflected in that a coset, a subalgebra of, uh, of affine vertex algebras of type B. So these 2n plus 1 free fermions, one can show with some work that they carry an action of SO to N plus 1 at level 1. The, uh, the, the diagonal coset is a W algebra of orthosymplectic type. Now, um, uh, so, uh, and, and these types of statements are, are what one uh, calls uh, coincidences or isomorphisms, they are nice, nice new realizations of the W algebras. And um, for example, uh, I, I, I always said that rigidity is quite hard to prove, right? And uh, one consequence you get is, so uh, Arakawa proved that for a certain set of, so similar statements first of all hold also for the simple quotients. Arakawa proved for a certain set of admissible levels called uh, principal and co-principal admissible levels. He proved uh, rationality of these W algebras. But then these uh, statements say that uh, the big VOA is a conformal extension of the, sub of the tensor product of the sub VOAs. And it turns out these extensions are so good that they give you tensor functors. In particular, one can use the known rigidity on these ones to prove rigidity on, on the big VOAs. So this is some very nice consequence. It's it all of a sudden something that you couldn't att uh, attack beforehand becomes for, uh, uh, come, uh, you, you get it for free. <coughs> okay. No. Yeah. Hmm. 
yeah, if, uh, if a critical uh, level, um, um, right, uh, at critical level, um, yeah, um, at, at critical. So the critical level is definitely not generic here. But um, so at, at, if, if k is equal to minus h check in this case, it turns out the w algebra they, they become completely commutative, okay? And uh, which is of course uh, fine. And it turns out the affine vertex algebra, right? And in, the, in that case, the um, uh, at, at critical level develops a large center um, and I'm pretty sure in that case there, well, okay. I, I don't know what happens here in the critical level case. Or, uh, so, so, yeah. But um, there's, uh, so this first theorem you should uh, call the coset theorems. And the second one is, is called a fagin frankel duality after Boris Fagin and Edward Frankel. And um, um, and let's see, uh, uh, so let, by R we denote the lacity, or R check, lacity of our Lie algebra G. And we also define just that formulas work out um, uh, R check to be equal to four for for always be one slash two n. So then, because then the following statement holds that the w, w algebra of G at level K is isomorphic to the W algebra at level L of the Lie algebra that I get by replacing uh, the Lie algebra whose root system is the co-root system. So it's usually called the Langlands dual. And what it means for simply laced ADE, the dual is just the same Lie algebra again. For B, it's C, so of CN of SP2N is SO2N plus one, uh, and F and G are also self dual. And always P1 slash 2N is also self dual. So it's only, uh, really this, uh, this, this here is only relevant in the relation between type B and C. And the relation between the two levels is that they're shifted levels. The, the, the level shifted by their respective uh, dual Coxeter numbers are multiplied to one if correcting by the lacity. Okay, now um, this statement is quite elementary to prove if you know about a third realization of W algebras. Namely, um, it turns out that uh, there's something that uh, uh, w algebras can al uh, also re be realized as subalgebras of free field algebras, so that's why they also become important. Subalgebras of a tensor product of a bunch of Heisenberg algebras and this beta gamma system, or if it's odd, also certain free fermions. And uh, uh, they are subalgebras, and the embedding is characterized by the by the kernel of certain. Uh, operators called uh, screening operators and uh, the, the, the screening operators they 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 have uh, such a very nice symmetry I mean that the kernel of a single screening operator is uh, always the, 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 the same if I I invert the relevant parameter so I, I don't want to go in any more uh, any any details all this is all I wanted to mention to that um, uh, but uh, now, what has become interesting is, uh, so um, over the last year in particular, physics realized that not on here, I almost always, always omitted the F for the principal Neil potent element. Now it turns out in, in practice, not only the principal W algebras appear, but much, much more appears. And they should enjoy a triality 
that vastly, uh, that, 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 that somehow nicely generalizes both theorems simultaneously. Right here, you should uh, think about it. The principle W algebra of type G has uh, three realizations as a coset, as, as uh, its definition as a W algebra, and as the W algebra of the dual Lie algebra at dual level. level. <coughs> at, which we call this then the fagan frankel dual level. And uh, now uh, let's, uh, let's see what we can uh, do in more generality. So it turns out um, if you have, uh, now you can generalize it for nilpotent elements that are somehow nice enough, and you can do this for type A, B, C, D, and OSP. And uh, for clarity, I only present A because, uh, okay. Also, the type A case was first discovered and it rely, relates nicely to, to spike instantons in the AGT correspondence. So, what do we do is we take G to be SL N plus M, and now we and now we have to specify a nilpotent element. So what do we do is we write down a big N by N block, and we we want our F to be principally embedded in this N by N block, and and that's it. So from the discussion um, of of this morning, we now this will give us a W algebra of a certain type. It will have fields of conformal weight one, two, up to n corresponding to this block. It will be will have an affine subalgebra of type GLM, and then it will have here fields of a certain conformal weight, depending on n, that in fact carry the standard representation and its conjugate of the GLM subalgebra. So this, uh, uh, these uh, W algebras are often called small hook type W algebras because this nilpotent element is uh, characterized by the partition n plus m is equal to n and then many ones. And the corresponding Young tableau is a column of height n together with uh, here a row of length m. And this is a small hook. Not very fat, right? So, uh, Hmm? So this this wants to uh, the, the hook is. is well, I see the hook, but I mean, but it's supposed to be. You think of it as a representation of what? Uh, the, as it, it characterizes the nilpotent element, right? Because the the, the, the we have S L N plus M, and uh, we 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 embed the nilpotent element in the upper n block n by n block, and trivially in all these one by one blocks. You can also think about it, uh, well, we have here the standard representation of SLN plus M, and we are the embedding of SL2 in SLN plus M. How does the standard representation decompose into the n-dimensional representation plus M copies of the one-dimensional representation? That's another way how, uh, to see the partition. Okay, let's define Psi to be the level shifted by the dual Coxeter number, the dual Coxeter number of SLN plus M is N plus M. And and now let's define W psi of N com M. We want to have some kind of uniform notation and it turns out there are a few boundary cases. So we want it to be the principal W algebra of SL N plus M corresponding to the, I mean, the W algebra of SL N plus M for this real potent element. And uh, as long, uh, uh, so this is for these values. And uh, if N is equal uh, to zero, we just take the affine vertex algebra of um, SLM times M copies of the beta gamma algebra that I introduced at some point. 
And this is, this is the bosonic analog of the free fermions. And just the beta gamma, respectively, the trivial view of A, if m is equal to 1 or m is equal to 0. Again, you probably do yourself a favor if you ignore these cases. They are just boundary cases to incorporate everything, in particular also to incorporate the known theorems. So what we want to look at is we want to uh, look at W algebras of this type. These are W algebras that's, that have an FN subalgebra of type GLM. So we can take the that, that that's the, the, the thing we want to go on with. And so we define uh, C for core set of type M comma M to be the commutant um, of its affine subalgebra. So the level of this affine subalgebra turns out to be psi minus m minus 1 inside the W algebra. And so this is for m non-zero and for m zero. This is in fact a principal W algebra. There is no affine subalgebra, so there is no need for us to take a core set. Okay. Now, uh, um, and now I want to get a triality of isomorphisms, but I, I, they, they have to, uh, and it turns out they have to uh, also involve super algebras. So I also now take SLN slash M, and in many respects, you might like to think about SLN slash M as N minus M. And um, we, we take the near potent element Fn, Fn slash M to be uh, the, the one that corresponds. Uh, what, has, what is SLN slash M? It is uh, N plus M times N plus M super matrices, super traceless ones. So in particular, we have an upper diagonal SLN, uh, SLN in which we can do the principal embedding. So this, uh, the corresponding W super algebra is extremely similar to the previous one. It has uh, also even fields of conformal weight one up to N. It also has an GLM subalgebra, and it also has uh, fields in the s of same conformal weight in the standard representation and conjugate of GLM, but with opposite parity. In that case, they are odd. That's the only difference. So it's a, uh, uh, okay. And now we, we define, uh, um, v psi n m very similarly to be the, the W algebra of SLN slash m for this nilpotent element in most inst instances. But now there are again a few uh, special cases. So this is, so here it turns out uh, I also have to, in, uh, the case n equals m is uh, special just because the Lie superalgebra SLN slash n is not simple and its simple quotient is PSL n slash n. So, um, um, so it, it is, it's just a, a little bit different and then um, two more boundary cases here. The BC denotes pairs of free fermions, and this is for m for n equals zero and m greater or equal to two. Then a single BC system for uh, m equals one and n equals zero, and trivial if both of them are zero. So, and uh, so this means the, the, the generic cases are always this W algebra, and then there are a few special boundary cases that. Um, that simply belong to the story. And then we define a D to be the, the, the core set.
Let me quickly finish this and then I come to the interesting statement. So if n is equal to m, it turns out one has to take an, uh, in addition the invariant un, invariance under a G1 action. I, uh, it's just a, a, a small subtlety here appearing. Uh, similarly, in the symplectic fermion case, one has to take uh, invariance under a GL1 action. And uh, if m is equal to zero, it is already um, just the W algebra, so there's nothing uh, we have to do. Okay, now uh, I have here this nice theorem and uh, this Fagan Frankel theorem here, and now let me uh, write down a theorem that, uh, that captures both of them immediately. It's called triality. It has been conjectured by Davide. Right, Gajotto and uh, Miroslav Robczak. And uh, it uh, says, uh, it's, it's the following, let Psi be generic. Um, then the following three are isomorphic. Yeah, we assume that n is uh, greater or equal to m. And uh, psi and psi prime are related by this formula. So and uh, we see, well, this, this relation is exactly this relation with lacy t1. This relation is exactly the relation on that side of the board with lacy t equal to 1. And if you uh, look at the specific cases where the second label is uh, 0, then in, in, we actually get exactly W algebras so that we recover this, uh, the combined coset and, um, and, and, and Fagan-Frankel duality statement. Okay, so um, now um, if you want to, yeah, do, do you want to hear about the proof? I, uh, um, I, I wanted to tell you more about how this, uh, this theorem now relates to physics and uh, geometry for, for the last hour so that we finally come to that. So first of all, uh, triality. Uh, so uh, uh, Gajotto and Rabczak, they wrote a quite influential paper um, uh, a bunch of years ago. They called it, called it vertex algebras at the corner. And what they wrote down is they wrote down certain interfaces of gauge theories and they <coughs> claim uh, oh, I, I don't get the accents correctly um, does, so there's yeah any anyway, rub check but uh, there are a few accents floating around um, <coughs> uh, so uh, Because this, I know, I mean, this whole stuff, I think it's using CFT to relate like it's into other connection. Yes. Um, is it the same as strings to Edison? I don't know. <laughs> where the level, yeah, well, where the level and the rank is interchanged. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, um, um, right, so the answer is uh, exactly what uh, Jörn is saying. Um, so uh, the um, so for generic uh, level, the answer is simply no. It's not related. And now, if you uh, uh, get to specific levels, you have even more coincidences. And in particular, um, and, uh, and, and and particular, 
you have something that's called level rank duality because you will have a coset. So what you will have is a coset where this L is also an integer and you replace the universal one by its simple quotient. And then here you have a coset and you take G to be SLM. So you have an L and an M floating around. Mm -hmm. And it turns out there is something called level rank duality that relates uh, this uh, to another core set which involves SLL. This level, L becomes the rank at level, uh, level M, the rank here. And uh, why does it appear? It appears because, well, it, it appears for, for, it's not hard to prove in fact. Anyway, it, it appears, but the, the conceptual reason why it appears is because at this special level, uh, representation categories degenerate, they become much nicer, modular tensor categories, mm -hmm. and you, you get a surprising equivalences between those, uh, which allow these coincidences to, to, uh, um, to, to exist. And in these equivalences of representation categories, you of course have uh, an identification of modules on the two sides, mm -hmm. and that's uh, a little bit of the tower duality type. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, there's, but um, but there's a lot of invariant theory in going into the proofs of this. So, but it's not tower duality on the nose, but it uses, for example, work by <laughs> <laughs> so, it, uh, the, the, there's, uh, so it's the, it's uh, it, it's really a VOA, VOA version of the, a lot lot of arguments are VOA versions of classical invariant theory. Okay, let me rephrase this uh, theorem in uh, physics language. So we we simply define new things called Y algebras, and these are just our old VOAs. Uh, our C and D VOAs tensored with a, um, with a Heisenberg algebra, and of course, the, which you really should think about, you just replace SLN by GLN everywhere, and SLN slash M by GLN slash M. So all I'm doing now is uh, I give these algebras new names. And the reason why I do this is I want to write the isomorphisms there in a compact form. So with, with this notation, I just call my D's and C's uh, Y's, and I add an additional um, um, So what else do we do? We, now we set Psi, we define it as the quotient of two new parameters, Epsilon 1 and Epsilon 2, an additional minus sign, and we uh, add an additional parameter satisfying the uh, uh, relation that all of our parameters add up to zero. And now we define the Y algebra depending on all of these three parameters subject to the above relations to be our Y algebra at the shifted level Psi. Why do you do this? Because then this theorem you just do the case-by-case -case analysis, um, can be rephrased uh, in this very nice form. And this is what I wanted to conclude my first lecture this afternoon with. So you, you now permute the epsilon labels and you permute the n labels in the same way. And then the theorem I wrote down is the same as uh, 
as uh, this isomorphism of Y algebras, and this holds then for all permutations of these three labels, and that's why it's called a triality. And the conjecture of uh, Gayotto, uh, Davide, <laughs> Davide Gayotto and Miroslav Rabchak was uh, actually bigger than what we proved because they also they introduced Y algebras where all labels can be non-zero. Um, the problem is uh, in that case uh, the cosets were cosets of W super algebras by affine vertex super algebras, and one key thing that we had to do here in this proof is we had to prove uh, uh, we had to prove a certain invariant theory statement, and we had to use invariant theory of the classical groups, and the invariant theory of the classical supergroups doesn't exist yet because it's way too difficult. So, um, and, and in particular, uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, um, anyway, they they have this a very nice, a very symmetric way uh, describing it, and um, now. We, we, let's have a break, but uh, what will I do after the lecture? I will draw a big Y and I will tell you um, what I understand about the physics about it. It's actually not too much. Um, any questions? Yes? So in the definition of Y, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 3, where does epsilon 3 come from? So yeah. This relation. Oh, it, it, it's it's yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, exactly. Hmm? So it's, it's, it's so good. Yeah, it's a yeah. So it's it's a it's a good exercise to verify a few things just to see how. Right, you you first have to come up with this nice thing, but uh, I mean, this this very nice way of writing isomorphisms. That's that's of course a way the physics setup gives it to you, and then uh, you yeah. Anyway. Um, Mm -mm. Yeah, anything else? Then let's have a coffee.